For my 35th birthday, I decided to give myself the gift of a colonoscopy. It's definitely not the best gift I've ever been given, but during the procedure, the doctors discovered something that caused them to abort the colonoscopy. And in today's video, with the help of the cadavers here in the lab, we're gonna discuss the process of receiving a colonoscopy and discover for ourselves exactly what's going on with my body and why the doctors would decide to bail on the procedure. It's gonna be a crappy one. Let's do this. Colorectal cancer is the third most common type of cancer worldwide, just behind breast and lung cancer. Precancerous growths called polyps can grow on the intestinal wall and if left unchecked can become cancerous and spread to your lungs, liver, and even your brain, although not every polyp will become cancerous. This is an almost completely preventable form of cancer. It's somewhere around 90% or so preventable. If you're over the age of 45, getting regular screenings is one of the most important things you can possibly do for yourself and your loved ones. And if you're under the age of 45, just looking for some peace of mind, I totally get that. Please feel free to speak with your primary care physician and get this process going. That's what I did, and now I have a much better understanding of what's going on with me digestively. All right, so let's go ahead and figure out what happened to me during my colonoscopy. Primary instrumentation they use during a colonoscopy is called a colonoscope. Now this is a very long, thin, flexible tube that can bend around the anatomy of the large intestine so they can see everything they need to. Now, real quickly, I wanna note the difference between the large intestine and the colon. So right here, this is what's known as the rectum. Then we have the sigmoid colon, descending colon, transverse colon, ascending colon, and then this right here is what's known as the cecum. Now, the cecum and rectum don't have colon in their name, and that's because they don't belong to the colon. The colon is going to be the sigmoid, descending, transverse, and ascending. But they are still able, through a colonoscopy, to investigate the entirety of the large intestine, and in fact, they can even go through here, which is known as the ileocecal valve, and then investigate the distal end of the ileum or the small intestine. So, when they insert this tube, you also have to, or the, the colonoscope, I should say, just understand there is a camera on it, there is a light on it, and there's also a port to eject water that they can kind of flush it, uh, things out and then they can remove that water if it has any particulates in there. There's also going to be an instrumentation port that they can insert, say if they find a polyp and they want to remove it, they can insert the instrumentation, go through the colonoscope, remove the polyp, take the polyp, and then take it out so then they can send that to pathology to be investigated. So what they do is they just come in here and what they're gonna do is they're gonna bring the colonoscope in and occasionally they might actually have what's called an endocuff on it. Now an endocuff is kind of like, kind of like, I don't know, kind of reminds me of a starfish. It has all these little appendages that come off and it allows to spread out the colon so they can investigate everything they need to. And they're gonna go through looking at the colonic wall and just making sure they don't see any ulcers or inflammatory bowel disease or diverticuli. Like a diverticula is actually an outpouching where the wall of the colon has ballooned out and it creates a little pocket. They're not inherently dangerous, but they can be. Again, this is all just investigative. And then they will go through the transverse colon, descending, and again, like I said, they could even go into um, the small intestine if they choose. But then what will happen is then they go backwards. And this whole process of going backwards will take about six to eight minutes. Let's say as they're going through here and the endocuff is spreading everything apart and they find a polyp. That's when, again, they insert the instrumentation through that port, will we'll come in there and they can actually like snare it. They can actually then like deprive it of blood and then remove it, and then they can take that out. But obviously if you do that, you're creating a wound and there is gonna be bleeding. But what's interesting is that upon the removal of a polyp, that bleeding will only, will only happen for a very uh, short period of time before it'll then just spontaneously stop bleeding. Colon just says, you're done with that. So they'll go through here and then, when they're done, they just remove it and you're essentially done, which is pretty awesome. I mean, this is a very short procedure. The whole thing really takes around 20 minutes or so from the time of insertion to exiting and making sure that everything's done. But with me though, things didn't go quite as planned. Now I have a very poor recollection of this, but there is something knocking around up there about them asking if I, wanted, if I wanted to continue, and I ended up making the decision to abort the procedure. The reason is, when they got all the way up to my splenic flexure, and they were gonna go into the transverse colon, 
they discovered that I have what's known as a tortuous colon or a redundant colon, meaning my transverse colon is abnormally long. So this is gonna kinda go be a little weird. I'm gonna, obviously that's gonna distort this, but if you have a longer transverse colon, it can actually start making loops that are not supposed to be there. So if you can kind of picture, if you're trying to get take that colonoscope and make it through all of these loops, that can be very difficult, if not outright impossible to do. And in fact, when they found this in me, they then pulled the colonoscope out and switched to a pediatric colonoscope, one that's meant for children. And they then inserted again and they still could not make their way through here. And apparently, again, I have no recollection of this, I didn't feel all that good. And I decided to abort the whole thing because I, it was just causing me discomfort. And you can even see this in my procedure report, which is super interesting for me to look back on. But so then they just kind of went out. So what's interesting is I just have images, kind of try and put this back, only up to about this point. I can see that my colon looks great all the way up to here and then all of a sudden, nothing. And so there's this part of me that's like, you know, even though my colonoscopy ended up really good, the results of what I got are pretty good, it's also like, oh God, well, what's going on over here? You know, what if there's something bad over there? It's kind of interesting that I went through all of this for only half of my colon to be investigated because now I know that I just have a really looped and I mean, I say this, you know, with love and respect, messed up colon. When it's all said and done, they take you back to a room so you can get dressed, you can kind of recuperate a little bit. They might even give you like some juice or maybe something very small to eat, like some crackers. And that's when your gastroenterologist will go over the results and what they experienced and what the whole procedure was like. And for me, this again, this was super, super fuzzy. They, um, they had to give me more medication when they realized I had a tortuous colon and I was experiencing discomfort. So for me, it's like I have kind of like an exaggerated recovery period. Um, but I do remember them coming in and discussing the whole thing with me. And in fact, they give you this. It's called a procedure report. Pretty cool. It goes over just exactly what happened, your doctor's names. Like there's a whole paragraph that's saying, hey, this is exactly what we did and how it went. Here's the medications you got. And they even give you pictures of your colon which I'm sure everybody wants. Like who doesn't want pictures of the inside of your colon? You can tell all your friends, right? Put it on your wall. But for me, you know, they I only have pictures all the way up until my splenic flexure because that's when they saw the tortuous colon. But, you know, I just wanna say that this is to me is one reason why I, I, I'm actually a believer in those under the age of 45 getting a colonoscopy because I would never have known, or at least not until I was 45, that I had this redundant colon. And having a redundant colon, that can come with certain issues. Like I'm more prone to constipation, for example. So if I was constipated, then it would kind of be mysterious. Like why am I experiencing constipation? Now I know. So the, there are definite advantages to getting a colonoscopy much earlier on than say going to 45. But again, this is something you wanna speak with your primary care physician about not just watch this video and say, all right, let's go schedule colonoscopy. Thanks for watching everybody. I hope you enjoyed today's video. As always, be sure to like, comment, subscribe if you feel so inclined, and we'll see you in the next video.